Hi everyone, my name is Crystal Larson, and this is part two of the Artist Optimization Series. And today we're going to talk about topics related to materials. We will cover batches, measuring shaders, material performance, and how to optimize your shader. In this presentation, I will be using different engines and softwares. Unreal Engine, Fatshark, BitSquid Engine, and Photoshop. Batches. When you render an object, the system works by doing this in batches to save time. Things that have the same properties can be done at the same time. Things that are not the same have to be treated separately. One of the biggest problems with performance in a game is that the batch count is too high. The batching is used by both the CPU and the GPU, so you can see it as a double performance loss if you have too many batches. However, it's even worse. The batching also affects the shadow rendering. So if you have two batches in your object, you will also have two batches in a shadow. A neat way of looking at it is that each material on an object casts its own shadow. It's worth noting that different systems work with batches different ways. Some with instancing, the possibility of merging batches of the same type. But it is safe to say that many batches is something that we need to avoid. So in order to decrease the number of batches, we need to understand what creates them. The batches are mainly split by materials. Each material creates one batch. But if a single mesh has several materials, there will be one batch for every material. Let's look at this example of different units. The object to the far left has only one batch. The object in the middle has two materials and thus two batches. The object on the far right has two meshes and two materials. This equals four batches. How to optimize? Well, the simplest solution is obviously to use as few separate meshes and materials as possible. However, there are some tricks that might help you when this is not possible. If you need many parts, for example, animating or moving something inside a unit, you can combine all meshes to one and skin it to bones. This way, the entire mesh will still be able to be animated, but still only counts as one mesh. You can also create LODs, level of detail steps, that has fewer materials far away, maybe even a single material composed of a low res texture baked from your original materials. Measuring shaders. Before we go into detail about how we optimize our actual shaders, we need to know how to measure the expense of our shaders. There are two basic ways, checking the instruction count and testing it on your platform. Instruction count. The most generic way is to simply count the instructions used in a shader. But what does that really mean? Well, all code, no matter what language it's written in, must be compiled into instructions to do hardware. Graphic stuff is needed to be compiled into something that the graphics card can understand. Think of it like instructions to a robot. Like robot turn left would be one instruction. A shader is compiled like this. You have your shader graph. That is compiled into shader code. That in its turn is compiled into assembler instructions. And finally, that is compiled into a graphics driver, which is used by your graphics card. So what the instruction really is, is the number of assembly instructions needed to make the graphics card perform a specific task. In our case, a bunch of rendering magic. However, there is a problem with just counting instructions. Each instruction can take a different amount of time. As an example, take the robot again. If you tell it the instruction, robot, take one step, it takes about a second. However, if you tell it the instruction, run a marathon, it will take the robot five hours. Both are one instruction to the robot, but way different in times. Shaders are no different. Looking at the instruction count will give you a number to compare to, and it's better than nothing, but it's in no way a flawless test. Testing on your platform. The best way to get a more accurate result than the instruction count is to test on your respective platform. As a side note, the same instruction count can take different amounts of time on different platforms. All systems have a profiler that lets you check the time the GPU takes to complete the task. 
each system has a variable degree of details. Anyhow, this time is what we're really after. Short time is good, long time is bad. A good way to test your material is to set up a scene. Fill the screen with objects that have the same base material. An expensive shader, usually your project's default shader. Make sure all objects that the camera sees have this shader. Set your system to have a fixed camera lighting, as lighting and the amount of pixels the camera can see of an object affects performance. Open your profiler and write down the time a single frame took to render. Now change all objects to your shader in the same scene. In the profiler, compare with your previous time. The goal is of course to keep the time as small as possible, but it's easier if you think in factors of the original time. Is it doing more and it's 1.2 times more expensive? It's okay to have it in a few places, no problem. If your shader is two times more expensive than the original shader, use it very sparsely. Is it four times more expensive? Use it only in otherwise very cheap areas, aka plan for it. Is it eight times more expensive? Well, go back to the drawing table. You get the picture. The rendering should take as little time as possible. To conclude this part. Instructions are like commands to a robot. Each one can take a different amount of time to execute. Looking at the instruction count is better than nothing, but should not be viewed as a complete truth. The best way to get accurate results are to profile directly on the console you're shipping on. A good way to do this is to set up a test scene with static lighting and camera setup. Then use a profiler to compare rendering times. Material performance. Before we go into the nitty gritty bits, we need to cover some generic things that always should be considered. What's faster, a vertex or a pixel shader? Why should we use MIP maps? Why do we need to keep an eye on transparency? What effects does input parameters have on performance? Pixel versus vertex shader. A vertex program is a program that runs once per vertex. This program does changes and converts your geometry, vertices and its data to what the rest of the pipeline can understand. A pixel shader, or fragment shader that it's really called, is a program that runs once or even multiple times per pixel. Its main function is to compute the final opacity, color, set value and texture coordinates. Different systems and interfaces have different ways of choosing which type of program you're working with inside the shader, and some even do this automatically. However, what's important in this section is the massive performance difference between doing things in the vertex program versus doing things in the pixel program. The heart of the performance issue is simply that in the vertex shader you have less data to work with. So if we take an example of a simple box with 8 vertices and it covers the entire screen. Ready for some math? On one side we have 8 vertices. On the other ring corner we have resolution width times resolution height, and this result divided by 2, as the pixel shader always does things in pairs. This gives us about a million pixels, if the fragment program runs once for every pixel. Doing operations on the vertex level means that we run the program 8 times. On the pixel level we run the program a million times. It's safe to say that if we do things in the vertex shader it's much cheaper, as the program needs to run way fewer times. One good thing to note is that while the number of vertices is always the same, the number of pixels is dynamic, based on rendering techniques and resolutions, hence why it's faster to sometimes render things in low res. So why don't we always do things in a vertex shader? Well, it's not always possible to get a result that's good enough. For example, if you want a gradient, between two vertices the only effect you can get is one color on each vertex. Or applying a texture would mean that only the vertices would get color, as there's nothing in between. Commonly, you can say that if you need intricate information between vertices, you must do it in the pixel shader. Let's look at an example. We're using a simple sine wave function to create a striped pattern. Look at the difference between the two. The one on the left is done in the vertex shader, and where the stripes miss the vertices, nothing happens. While if done in the pixel shader, this works fine. I will show you the graphs just in case if you want to recreate this example. 
Note that in the following examples, I've done it in the FatShark engine, as the Unreal engine does not allow you to explicitly choose vertex or pixel space. This is the code that gets evaluated in the vertex shader. This is the code that now by using the pixel space node gets forced to be evaluated in the pixel shader. The pixel space node forces everything after it to run in the pixel shader. MIP maps. Though MIP maps increase memory, it can make or break the performance of your game. If you, for example, have a terrain that blends, say, three materials, that's nine textures, normal albedo material mask. Without MIP maps, this could half your frame rate. So how does MIP maps work? Well, when you want a texture on your object, you need to read it and then apply it to the object. Simplified, this is called sampling. This is normally done in the pixel shader. So for each pixel on the screen, we sample that texture. What? Do we sample a texture a million times? Yes. Yes, we do. So therefore it needs to be fast, or as fast as it possibly can be. One way that Lance Williams figured out in 1983 was to have several versions of the same image, but in different resolutions. What this in turn lets you do is instead of sampling the full resolution texture for every pixel, the system can now calculate the distance to an object and choose a sub-texture that's way lower in resolution and only sample that instead. So if a pixel is far away, all the way to the horizon, with MIP maps, now you don't need to sample a full 2048 by 2048 pixel texture, but maybe just a 4x4 pixel texture, which is way, way faster. The most common image format today that supports MIP maps is the DDS, Direct Draw Surface Format. MIP maps can either be created by using plugins to this format in your respective image editing software. But most game engines have this functionality built in, and instead have settings to create MIP maps directly in the editors. Transparency One of the most expensive operations you can do in a shader is to have something transparent. There are many different reasons to why this is expensive, where one of them is sorting. The system has to make sure things are rendered in the correct order. This is simply to make sure that you can see an object through another object. In order to get the sorting etc. right, each pixel needs to be processed several times. Like processing a couple of millions were not enough, now we need to do them several times. There are two basic types of transparency you might have heard about. Full bit alpha and one bit alpha. The regular implementation when you use one bit alpha is that the fragment shader cuts away everything that has a color. This is called alpha test and can be set in most shaders. When I say cut away, it's a way of saying to the system, I know that it's either solid or fully transparent. It doesn't need to do expensive calculations for rendering things like semi-transparency, etc. It's the cheapest form of transparency. If you want to use the more expensive full bit alpha, the alpha technique is called alpha blend. So why don't we always use 1 bit alpha, as it's so much cheaper? Well, it simply doesn't look good in all scenarios. The 1 bit approach doesn't have any gradients, nor can it ever be semi transparent. In the picture you can see here, there's some hair that uses 1 bit alpha to the right and you can clearly see the difference between the techniques. Now one thing that's often overlooked is that even fully transparent part of your texture costs almost as much as other parts, so it's very important to reduce the number of pixels with transparency. How to optimize? So what can we do to optimize this? Well, use only alpha when you really need it. Use one bit or alpha test where you can. Cut polygons to reduce fully transparent pixels. Now this is important, so I will show you an example of this. In this example you could see a tree with only square planes as the geometry for the branches. Next to it you could see how the individual planes look with only the alpha mask. Notice there's a lot of black pixels. If we take a pass on the geometry and cut away the planes to match the image better, we will have removed a great deal of fully transparent pixels and imagine a forest with these trees, 
this simple operation alone can save many, many FPS in your game. Input parameters. Input parameters are things that control shaders from the game. For example, when you get close to an object, it could change color. Normally these are costly, but it has more to do with the system outside that controls the shader, rather than the shader itself. However, if you have changes that need to be done every frame to a shader, you should consider some optimizations. Say that an object will change color when you are within one meter of it. The change takes three seconds. What you do is move in the time-sensitive code inside the shader, and what you send from the outside is a start trigger and a time length, in this case three seconds. In the shader we simply use a time node and change the color until the timer reaches three seconds. To conclude this chapter, here are the highlights to remember. The vertex shader is way faster than the pixel shader. Do as much as you can in the vertex shader, but certain things cannot be done in the vertex shader. If you need intricate information between vertices, use a pixel shader. MIP maps should be used to save performance. This way, each pixel doesn't have to sample a full resolution texture all the time. Transparency is expensive. Use one bit if you don't need a full bit alpha. Always cut away fully transparent pixels if you can. Input parameters do not cost, the system driving them does. If you want to change every frame to your shader, consider moving parts of the logic inside the shader. How to optimize your shader? I will cover four generic ways of optimizing your shader. Removing unnecessary stuff, refactor math, refactor pipeline, and samplers. Remove unnecessary stuff. It is really as easy as it sounds. Just make sure all your code or nodes are doing something. If not, remove it. Here are some ideas what to look for. Math that always ends up being the same result should be a simple constant or removed altogether. It's very common to find a large chain of many nodes that in the end always result in the same output. Another one is math that ends up always being zero. Should not be there. Why I take this up as an extra point is that I've seen many cases where a node or a color always ends up black. And math with entire vectors for no use. Doing math with say vector 3 plus vector 3 is way more expensive than a single value plus a single value three times more expensive to be exact. So make sure you use all your channels in your math or redo the math so it only affects the values you actually are using. Take this example. We're only using the red channel of the calculation as output. And the two inputs are black and white values, aka the same value in all three channels. We can just as well use one value from there as well. The math in the bottom is more performant as it only does math with a red channel, while the top one does red, green, blue times red, green, blue for no use at all. Features that are forgotten. Basically things that were used at one point but are not anymore. They are simply left inactive in the shader but still contribute to the expense. More than one time, a lerp or a multiply is set to null, to turn off a previous result, while the code still runs. In this example, you could see an old feature turned off, by setting the lerp mask to zero. And in the bottom half, you could see how the shader should look. Reduce the amount of texture samplers. Texture samplers are one of the most expensive instructions there are, so keep them to a minimum. I will come back to this in a later section, as it has some tricks to it. Refactor math What I mean with refactor math is not necessarily to use fewer instructions or nodes in a graph, but cheaper instructions instead of more expensive ones. One of the more expensive instructions is the power function. I will show an example of how to make a shader without one. The most common way of using a power function is when you want to have a sharper, more crisp look to something, usually in a scenario like this. This is a mask that is used to control where the moss is on an object. The left picture has a power of 100, the right one has a power of 1. I will now show you a live example. Here you can see a classic blend shader in the Unreal Editor.
nothing strange here. I know it looks a bit messy, but we just have to uh, live with it. Um, so in here, you can see we have a power node and the exponential part of this is now set to 100. If I set this down to two, you're gonna see change coming up right here. And that's how it looks. So if you take a look at the mask itself directly into the base color, you will see that um, not only does the, this um, exp set the sharpness, but it also quite heavily affects the height, which is in some cases what you want. Um, but if we set this back to 100, this is how it looks. The white part is where the moss is going to be, and the black part is where the moss is not going to be. Um, this is a very expensive part, um, because this power node is really, really expensive. So not only gonna, we're going to make it cheaper, we're only going to make it better to control or easier to control. Um, so instead of this power node, um, what we're going to do is we're going to rip this out and we're going to take that out. So this is the expensive part. Even though this part has way more nodes, it is way, way cheaper. So the ad's going to come in here. So now what's going to happen is that you see that we have the same mask, but not only can we set the sharpness, um, here it's called mossiness, and if I set this to, I don't know, five, and one, for example, you see that you have basically the same result as you had in the in a power node. However, you also have a new one called Moss Height, which is quite decent because now you can control the height separately and it is cheaper. So if you put this back to, I don't know, say 20, um, sorry, wrong one. This one <laughs> is now used. Um, and we can say this is 0.8. You could see we could also can control the height of where it's going to be. And if we now look at the actual output value of this, you have basically the same result. Way cheaper but way easier to control. You have both the strength or the sharpness and you have the height. So what have I done? Well, it is actually quite simple. If we work in a factor of height and sharpness, you would take whatever mask you have um, and you will subtract the height value. You will multiply this with the sharpness value, and you will add the heightness value again, and usually a clamp. This is way more effective, and it's way, way faster. With these fixes, this shader is now way cheaper, and for, say, a big rock that covers the entire screen, this fix can shave off several milliseconds from the rendering time. In order to give you something to relate to, I will show you a list of different instruction costs. However, across the board you need to know that instruction expenses are multiplied by the number of variables. For example, the add instruction has the cost of 1, and by using a single value to add, aka 1 variable, the cost becomes 1 times 1, aka 1. A vector 2 that has two variables and adds has the cost of 2 times 1, aka 2. A vector 3 add has the cost of 1 times 3, so that becomes three, etc. There's not much to say about this list except 
look at it and compare it to what you do in your shader. There are, however, one thing that needs to be noticed. The inverse trigonometry functions a sin, a cos, a tan is evil as doom and do not use them. The reason is that there's no hardware support for it, so everything is done in software. But just to be clear, just use them if you really, really need to. Refactor pipeline. What I mean with refactoring the pipeline is that when you have similar code paths doing almost the same thing and you have repetitions in your pipeline, it's always a good idea to try to remove those repetitions to refactor the pipeline. I will show you one example of how we can make a distort shader more efficient. So here we have a simple distortion shader. And what you can see up here is that we have two pipeline paths that are basically look exactly the same. So what we can do here is to replace both these parts to a single part. So basically what I've done is I've taken both to these two vector two values, I put them in a vector four, and that allows me to basically just rip these parts out, or I can save them. Um, and Voila, I have the same result, but I only have one pipeline. So instead of doing all of this, I'm doing this instead. Nothing strange with the math, it's just to show that if you have one path in the pipeline, it's much easier to do changes, to find bugs, etc. But it also makes a more efficient shader. Samplers. As I mentioned before, samplers are one of the most expensive things you can have in a shader. Not only are the instructions expensive, but the different types of samplers are even more expensive. The main types are point, linear, and anisotropic. Points are very rarely used, as this does not do any blends between pixels, but it can be useful for storing specific types of masks where you don't want pixels to blend, or maybe in a pixel look game. Linear is the most commonly used sampler type, and it is a bit more expensive than point. However, if you have far stretching pieces of geometry, linear may not be enough either. In this case, you have to use the super expensive anisotropic one. As you can see in the top part of this image, the linear one blends everything to a blur far away, while the anisotropic one does not. This is because it takes multiple samples. Anisotropic 4 means 4 samples, etc. This is why it's massively more expensive than other types. So use only this in very, very rare cases. When you're making a ground shader, it normally uses several different textures, as it usually blends materials like grass, dirt, etc. But it also most likely uses anisotropic samplers, as it can stretch on for very long. This is why this is normally the most expensive shader in the game. In all cases, it's important to remove samplers, and one way to do this is to pack all the black and white textures into the same texture. I will show you an example of this. This is the sampler test that I've done. Uh, it's a basic um, wet pebble material. Um, and you can see here we have a lot of samplers. So what we can do here is that we can pack all of these together um, to one texture. I mean, we have three black and white textures uh, for no use at all. So what we can do is... Uh, Basically, jump, in, jump into Photoshop. This is actually very simple. You just open all the textures that you want to combine in, say, Photoshop. You create a new texture. And what you do is you simply take one of these other textures, select your newly created one and one of its channels, and you paste that in there. And you're done. And now we have this node which is um, a co the combined texture. So instead of using the three textures, we now have one texture, but we just pipe in what we put in um, the different channels into this instead. 
So now you can see the result is the same, but we use way few samplers and we have made this shader a lot faster. To conclude this chapter, remove all unnecessary pieces in your shader. Make sure all parts do something in the end. If not, remove them. Do not do math with entire vectors if you don't need to. Samplers are super expensive. Have as few samplers as possible, and a good way to do this is to pack all black and white textures into one. Only use anisotropic samplers if you absolutely need to. Replace expensive instructions to cheaper ones. Check the list. Remove repetitions in your code and clean up your pipeline. This was all for this part of the artist optimization series. And today we have covered what batches are and how to avoid creating more than we need. How to measure shaders by counting instructions or testing it on your platform. We learn about material performance and what is faster pixel or the vertex shader and what we can do in them. We figured out how to use MIP maps and the fact that we have to use MIP maps and to keep an eye on transparency as well as a short stop on input parameters. We took a look at how we can optimize our shaders by removing unnecessary stuff, refactor pipelines and the math, as well as keeping the samplers to a minimum. My name is Crystal Larson. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you in the next part. Have a nice day.